Grazie miteinander. Hello. Welcome to the first dialogue in our Rethinking Living series. My name is Dr. Chris Lubkamin, Head of Foresight at the ETH in Zurich. Today's topic is the fate of forests. Forests are fascinating, they're critical to our very survival, and they're very special interest to the younger generations. Can we actually stop climate change and should we? I wanted to ask what we as individuals can actually do when the most damage is done by the biggest corporations. And my question is, what will happen when we reach our tipping point of the deforestation? What will the effects be? I hope and expect to find the answers to these questions from our amazing guests today. And I'm looking forward to it. Let me introduce our guest to you. First, we have Rachel Garrett, Professor of Environmental Policy at the ETH. She calls herself an environmental social scientist. I look forward to hearing more about this. She uses an on-the-ground approach to understand what can reduce forest degradation and loss while improving the lives of those people who live there. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Next to her is Tom Crother, Professor of Global Ecosystem Ecology, the founder of Restore, and sits on the advisory board of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, both of which will be launching next month. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for having me. And we're also going to be having a third guest joining us later. Now, it may look like we are sitting up high in central Switzerland, however, we are actually in Audi Max, here in the Centrum campus of the ETH, right downtown Zurich. We are with proper distance. We even have plexiglass shields between us. I'm sure we would all wish we were able to be really close to each other and being able to talk, but with these new normals, this is what we have to do. And we're also glad that we can teleport ourselves back up to the top of the Rigi under the Rethinking Living Dome. So let's get on with it. Rachel and Tom, you both have recently relocated to Switzerland. Uh, Rachel, you came from? Boston, the United States. From Boston to the US, and Tom, you came from? Wales. I don't know if I need to be more specific than that. <laughs> well, you that's good enough. It's, it, well, it's, it's not England. That's the, that's the <laughs> important thing at this that point, right? Yeah. Very true. So for both of you, why did you come here? Are the forests here so amazing that you had to leave your home countries? Rachel? Well, the forests here are amazing. So quality of life was definitely important. But mostly I came here because I can do the research that I've always dreamed of um, with the support from ETH. Uh, and I've been able to launch a, a really large team to be doing research all over the tropics. That's fantastic. And Tom, why did you come? I mean, I find the question bizarre. I get it a lot. And I... <laughs> <laughs> cannot understand the basis for this question. Why would you come to paradise? <laughs> There's beautiful crystal clear rivers and lakes and mountains. And yes, the forests are spectacular. And also we've come to one of the best universities in the world that provides such opportunity for, for great research. So it's, yeah, it's just, I've come to Narnia. Well, that's wonderful. Well, we're glad both of you are here really sincerely. The fate of forests. Why should we care? Rachel, why should we care? Um, they're essential to our well-being, so they provide us with climate security, with food security. They protect us from floods, from landslides. Um, but more importantly, they also provide us with uh, a sense of, of peace, of, of satisfaction, of, of beauty and, and spirituality. So we can't live without them. Mm. That's great. Tom, what about you? What, why, why do you think we should care? I think Rachel said it perfectly. We, you, we cannot live in the absence of nature. Mm. Um, forests being a very key component of that, but all ecosystems are equally important for life on, on this planet. And you know, there's enough, there's, we all have our personal stories about our connection with nature and how vital it is for our happiness and well-being. And there's an ever-growing body of literature that says the same thing. You know, what, the more degradation we see, 
the, the more we see declines in economic stability and human well-being across the globe. Mm. And, 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 you know, we can all connect with nature on, on, on the, at the local scale, but it's also vital for us all at the global scale. Yeah. So when you guys, so it's, a, it's a really, so it's really from, as you said, the global, this is economic, it's internal, it's personal, spiritual. When you walk in a forest, what do you look for? What do you see? Rachel? Unfortunately, what I see mostly is how we've harmed them. Mm. Um, I, I see that most of the forests that I've ever gotten a chance to walk in are, are not uh, intact forests. Mm. They're heavily degraded already. And, um, and mostly I think about my children not being able to experience them even possibly as well as I do now. That's, mm -hmm. what, I, that's what I think about. Oh. And Tom, what about you? I've had a bit of a change in the last couple of years. Until two years ago, all I ever saw was the logs and the bugs living under them. I couldn't walk through a forest <laughs> without getting 10 meters without having to dig up a log and find the fascinating, infinitely diverse mm. world of, of insects and fungi and animals that are all feeding on one another and interacting with one another to, to maintain their healthy little ecosystem. It's like, it's like outer space aliens. Mm. Um, but in the last couple of years, I don't know why, but my perspective has gone upwards. And now I spend a lot of time in my hammock up in Zuriberg Woods and staring up the trunk of a tree to the leaves above is just the most inspiring thing ever. Mm. I spend a lot of time in there. Mm. So going from, the, from the, the grubs to the foliage, that's an interesting transition. So what, is an, what does an intact forest look like compared to what, when we walk here, What's, what's missing? Or what, tell me a little I bit mean, about that. They can look very different all over the world. Obviously, uh, there's so many different types of forest ecosystems. But when you, when you try to walk through the Amazon, you can't even walk through the Amazon because there's so much life. Mm. There's just so many layers and, and so many things. Um, but uh, you also, I guess one of the things that's most striking is the size of the trees. How, how, how gigantic they are. Um, you can't even link up with two, three other people and get your arms around some of these beautiful trees. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, the same goes if you go up to the, the temperate forests. It's not how wide they are, but it's how tall they are. Mm. You can't see the ends of them. And so yeah. that's giving you a sense of what maybe an intact forest looks like compared mm -hmm. to what we have. That's really great because I think in California, with some of the big redwoods. Exactly. It, it's, yeah. There's almost nothing because no light gets to the ground. Yeah. Which was quite different. Maybe Very different, yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> amazing. E equally majestic. Yeah. <laughs> so today is National Climate Day here in Switzerland. What would you like us as citizens of Switzerland to remember on this day when we think about forests? Tom, what would you like us to remember? It's such a hard question, but I, I would say... We, it's worth remembering that we are obviously the first generation facing these terrifying global threats of biodiversity loss and climate change, which are threatening the well-being of humans everywhere. But we are also the first generation that understands the scale of the challenge, the system that's necessary to, to change if we're going to address that challenge. And we have the chance to, in every single decision we make, start to fight against these enormous global threats. And that's an incredibly empowering thought, I think. And Rachel, what about you? What, what, what would you like us to remember on this, on this day when we think about forests? That it's something that everyone should care about and that everybody should be advocating for, uh, the protection of our forests and the restoration, because it is critical to your own well-being. And you can do something about it. You can pressure governments, you can pressure companies you can make a difference. And, and that's possible now because we live in such a globally interconnected world and a more transparent world. And so if you are, are joining forces with these larger movements to apply the right pressure in the right places, I think we can finally start to tackle this issue at the scale that's required. That's great. Well, thank you both for that. And good, good things for us to remember on this day. So Rachel, we're going to take some time now to dig a little bit deeper into your research. Are you ready? Okay. Great. Let's do it. <laughs> so, as you know, we visited a class at the Canton Schule in Inge, in Zurich. And we heard, we heard from a few of those students earlier 
the very beginning with some of their questions. We'll come back to those a bit later. And we're going to see more of them throughout our time together. Two of the students had the chance to meet with you in person. And, and the closest rainforest that we could mm -hmm. find which was the uh, Mazala Hall at the Zurich Zoo. We're going to hear from them. Tell me about your work. Why are we here today? Yeah, so my work is really focused on trying to protect places like this. So this beautiful oasis, which is actually modeled on the rainforest in northern Madagascar, it's just one hectare, but it's home to over 300 animals. And every day, an area 30,000 times the size of this rainforest is cleared. Mm. Every day. Oh, and an equivalent, <laughs> yeah. What inspired you and where did, this, where did your journey start to help save the rainforest? Actually, when I was your exact same age, I was super lucky <laughs> to be in an ecology class where we got the opportunity to go to Costa Rica and visit a rainforest just like this. And um, at the time, I was mostly interested in the actual plants and you know that ecosystem. But when I got there and I saw that the reason these rainforests were being cleared was often for these very unproductive agricultural systems. And so basically people were clearing these beautiful forests, but also not getting anything out of it. And so at that point I decided that I was going to spend my career trying to find solutions that could help protect the remaining rainforest, but also try to benefit the people that are living there. What could we do today to try and help save the Amazonas? Well, there's two things. You can do things through your individual behaviors, uh, what you buy, mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, also how you vote and then what your country does to help. So is it better if I buy like things that I know are produced like fair trade from the Amazonas or is it better to buy things that are locally produced so I know that there is no damage done? That's one of the great things about being Swiss consumers and Swiss citizens. You've got all the big companies right here and so you can put pressure on them to have sustainable policies. Mm -hmm to make sure that you are getting the products that you want that don't have um, deforestation. How do they actually control the farmers and their behavior? You have the military police who are trying to use satellites um, and to monitor all these different land parcels to see if there's been clearing and then go out and find those farms and take away their machinery. But, uh, you know, as you can see, we can come on inside this is uh, just surely not up to the scale of the challenge. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's a problem of a lack of resources. How do you believe that your research and your projects will contribute to saving the Amazonas and making more sustainable supply chains? Yeah, well, because these companies are such a game changer in getting involved in trying to control deforestation, what we do right now is focus a lot on how they can make those policies effective but also equitable. And what I mean by that is they're becoming increasingly capable of using this satellite technology to monitor all of their suppliers and, and block them. But for, that, for us, that's not good enough. We actually want to make sure that they can also include those smaller farmers and not just immediately block them. And that might mean that they need more education, that they need more information, or they just need financial support in paying for the costs, or it might mean some of these social uh, status uh, issues and to try to make it cool to actually be a sustainable farmer selling into these global markets rather than for it to be cool to be accumulating lots of land and lots of cattle. So that's what we're trying to actually test on the ground. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your origin story. That was really very inspiring to hear how that, that moment that spark changed everything for you. Yeah. That's really cool. One hectare, 300 animals. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, when we're seeing the losses which you described, all the animals are getting slaughtered as well. Or do they move or what happens with mm -hmm. that? Well, um, you can lose the animals without losing the forest. First of all, that's important to know. So mm. we can have empty forests due to, to human pressure on those systems. People live there, they hunt, 
Um, they also degrade the remaining forest. But then when you also clear such large tracts, and then there's you know, fewer reservoirs of, of healthy forests left for them to um, you know, obtain everything they need to right. not only survive but reproduce, then eventually there's just nowhere left for them to go. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the most iconic images, of course, you've probably already seen here in Switzerland of the orangutans without habitat in Borneo, um, but there's lots of smaller creatures that sure. are equally important all over yeah. the tropics and all over the forests all over the world. There's a whole system. Well, thank you for that. So one of the students asked you a difficult question, which is whether it's better to buy locally or look for a fair trade label when you're in the store. What, yeah. help, help, help us with that. Um, so that's a difficult question to yeah. answer in a short period of time yeah. um, because there's always trade-offs involved. So first of all, uh, you can't get everything you want from Swiss farmers. The climate's just not perfect and it's a small country. Uh, there are also benefits to importing products from other regions to those regions. You can help improve the lives of people who live in other countries by buying from them. So, yes, it would be amazing if we had sort of, you know, uh, reliable certifications that covered every product. But right now, they're just not at that scale. So, you know, you, you can do your best to try to do your research on the companies that produce different food yep. and put pressure on the retailers themselves yep. to try to make sure they have sustainable products. So, unfortunately, we can't offload our responsibility to a little green thing on a package. We, we still need to be smart. Yeah, we can't buy our way out of this problem. Right, exactly. We have to change the system. Yep. So, I mean, yes, what I'm trying to say is it's, it's hard to try to rely on buying all the right products as an, and individuals. Yep. Yeah. So you also brought us some footage about the forest, so the, some of the benefits of the forest. We're going to take a look at that right now. Maybe you can talk through, help us see what, what's there sure. for us. I mean, we've already discussed how crucial forests are to our well-being. Um, as I said, they are critical to our climate. The Amazon itself produces rainfall for the rest of South America. Hmm. Um, and so it also is critical to our food security. And lots of people live there and they, they derive their, their sense of place, their sense of self, um, their spirituality from, from their life in the forest. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, when we lose these forests, uh, we, we not only emit mass, massive amounts of, of uh, greenhouse gases into the air that threatens our climate, um, but we also suffer innumerable other harms. Yeah, it's just devastating when you see these pictures, especially in... Um, but you say, I, quick question, Amazon produces rainfall? It's a rainforest, so it produces rainfall? Yeah, so the Amazon, you know, the Amazon forest produces a ton of extra moisture that provides these sort of rivers in the sky that oh. carry rainfall oh. um, further to the south and support the production that happens in Brazil and elsewhere in South America, which is one of the largest food producers in the world. So it's almost, these rainforests are almost like the springs that we have here up in our Alps for the Rhone and the Rhine River. Absolutely. Great analogy. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. Thank you for that. Um, you also talked to us at the very beginning about how a rainforest is being destroyed, and you did a staggering, some staggering um, statistics. Can help me understand the scale and, and why, the, why does this matter to us here in Zurich? So... Um, so just to give you some numbers, yeah. Uh, yeah. in the last 20 years, we've lost 361 million hectares of tree cover. And of that, about 60 million hectares were primary tropical forests, so the original rainforest. And that, those numbers are probably difficult to fathom, but let's say those 360 million hectares, that's the size of much of Europe. And the 60 million hectares, that's larger than Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and the Netherlands put together. That's an unbelievable. Yeah. And if that was a country, it would be um, a source of emissions larger than all of the EU. And it accounts for about 18% of gross global emissions. And I think we have some footage of you. And you've given graphically represented this, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it's, so you exactly. can help, help us with that. So, so all of these um, purple pixels are, are tree cover um, at the threshold of 75% of, of the canopy. And here you can see just how this, these forests are lost um, for agricultural expansion. And as I've said, that, that rainforest itself, the 
is the size of Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, and Austria combined. Um, so if this was a, a, a country, it'd be a source of emissions larger than Europe, and it accounts for 18% of, of um, gross annual emissions. Conversely, however, um, the annual regrowth uh, of trees can pull out 10% of the annual emissions. So mm. essentially, they're just a, a key critical part of the, our climate security. It's a phenomenal. I mean, again, these are just devastating images to think that this is just happening on a daily basis. Daily yeah. basis. Yep. <laughs> and one of the students asked about the tipping point. At some point, the tipping point is when we go beyond a moment when the, these things don't recover. How close are we? Yes, well, uh, it's highly uncertain what that exact number is, but it could be as early as um, when 20% of the original extent of the Amazon rainforest is lost, then the Amazon forest could start to die back. And, and what would be expected then is that it would turn into a different ecosystem, more like a savanna. Uh, unfortunately, where we are right now is 18% of that original rainforest has been lost already, mostly for cattle pastures and some soy farms. That's a, that's a sort of a staggering number yeah 18 to 20 percent i mean that it is That's as i said uncertain, plus or minus, but, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but at the current rate of of degradation five years two years what do you have a just give me a give me a, mm. a, a shot take the dart and throw <laughs> no. um uh i think it could be in the next 10 years certainly 10 years. Cer certainly if we continue um, at peak deforestation like we were in the early 2000s. Of course, deforestation's been happening in the Amazon since the 1960s and 70s. Right. So um, that's why so much has been lost already. Right. Well, thank you for that. I know, I know as a scientist you don't like giving an exact number because it's all, <laughs> you said before, a little bit tough right now. But Tom, we saw a lot of degradation there. And can, can it be restored? Or is it, when, once we've got a lot of times we lose the soil, etc. Is it possible to get any of that back so we can slow that number down? So this is, a, again, one of the biggest questions that, that we face in, as ecologists is trying to figure out what can be done. Um, and we believe that huge areas of this land are available, you know, are, are, are still capable of natural recovery. And if they can naturally recover, that is generally the process that leads to the greatest you know, the, 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 the most sustainable development of those ecosystems, trying, you know, getting them back on the course to going towards those pristine, beautiful ecosystems that Rachel's mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, in many regions around the world, though, uh, as a result of usually more intense human activity, uh, like mining or, or intense agriculture, we do see extents, you know, large extents of um, land degradation. And in those places, yes, it's, it's often necessary to facilitate the regeneration of those ecosystems, either by amending the soil, managing those ecosystems uh, in useful ways, you know, bringing, bringing um, irrigation or, 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 or nutrients even into yeah. that soil, and also by you know, restoring trees in some areas. But, but we believe that the, the vast majority of that land can regenerate naturally, and, 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 and the, the sort of assisted regeneration or the planting of trees is more useful uh, in sort of economic... Um, or to bring economic benefits to local communities by restoring the right mixtures of species that can bring, bring lots of um, food. It made me think of something you were saying that it's almost as if the land, some of the land is broken, just like with your foot, mm -hmm. and you need to splint it for a while just until there's a chance to get back, right? And that's in, so to restore. You know, this is sort of, well. yes, no. No, I, not quite. Okay, all right, all right. Well, <laughs> it's, we're going to let that one go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, nice we'll let that one go. It's close enough, I guess. You could say it was broken for people as well as the ecosystem. Exactly. I think Tom, what Tom's getting at is, is you can't just go from a system that's being used by people and then just completely section it off and let it grow. Yep. Oftentimes you need to develop some sort of solution that's also good for the people already living there. Yep. So, yeah. And you have yeah, some it, footage you, should, you brought with us with some of the with you on the yeah. ground with some of the cattle forts. Can we take a look at that? And before we do that, we have a question for you okay. from a student. <laughs> Hi, my name, is, my name is Antonia. And my question is, are there any sustainable alternatives for the local cattle farmers? 
alternatives for cattle farmers? You said this is one of the issues. So a short answer because we got some footage with you visiting some in a minute. Sure. Yeah. So there's two parts to more sustainable cattle ranching. First is don't clear any more forest um, and restore areas that are really important, like riparian areas next to streams and steep slopes. But then you can go further and actually dramatically improve production practices. Mm. You can integrate crops. You can integrate trees right on the farm. And in doing that, we've actually found you can increase the farmer's income by six times. Wow. And reduce all these other environmental impacts on the farm. So actually, in this case, there are some win-wins. Um, there are some great alternatives to what's being done right now. That's really fantastic. So really getting more systems thinking instead of Absolutely. mono. That's it. So let's take a look at the footage right now, and you can tell us what we're going to be taking a look at. Okay. So what I do is I try to um, find land use practices, like the ones I just discussed, mm -hmm. and complementary policies that can help incentivize farmers and enable them to transition to more sustainable systems. And, and by more sustainable, I mean conserving our remaining forests, but also improving their own incomes and improving their own lives. Um, so one of the big things we do is work with companies, many of which are based in Switzerland, to try to develop uh, all these incentive systems through the supply chain to actually reach these farmers and try to um, help them transition into those new practices. Mm -hmm. That's really, it's really important to be able to do that. Now, when I look at this land, some of it seems like it's just barren and not able to do anything. Others, you know, but so how do you, how do you as a farmer help, help, how do you work with them to help them see or the opportunity which this, this kind of mindset change can right. bring? Right. So, so this doesn't seem barren to them. It's probably a source of massive pride. Hmm. Um, hmm. It was long the culture they were told by their government. They were supported and, um, and, and praised for clearing this land, hmm. for accumulating cattle. Um, but amazingly, because there's so much rain and so much life, you can, you can actually quite quickly turn this into a much more productive system. And, and where there's forest nearby, forests can grow back very quickly. If you just fence it off from further degradation from cattle, that forest will grow back very quickly, actually. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that you do work with large corporations. What are, what are the, give us some idea, insights into what you do with some of them? Yeah, so, I mean, companies have already been under pressure for a decade to clean up their supply chains. Most of them, most of the large ones, most of the ones based in Switzerland have already made a commitment to not source products associated with deforestation. The problem is they don't know how to do that. Mm. And sometimes when doing that, they can end up hurting a lot of the most vulnerable farmers. So we try to, uh, to test along with them and, and, and observe and measure what the impacts of certain different policies and implementation mechanisms have been and provide them with information about what works and what doesn't. And in our latest research, we're actually working very closely with the world's largest companies to try to do a more experimental approach where we can control and measure the impacts of, of specific um, educational campaigns, attempts at cultural change, and, um, and different financial support and legal support mechanisms for smaller farmers. So what's the, what, what role does then government play in this, both international, regional, local? Because yeah. corporations are like a world into itself, right. but they have rules they have to play in. I mean, for, for far too long, they've had far too few rules that they've had to deal with. I think even a lot of the corporations would like for there to be more rules in a more even playing field. Um, so this is where governments come in, uh, both governments in the producing regions and governments in the importing countries like here. Uh, they can set the stage for what rules companies have to abide by. But even if companies go beyond that, which they're doing right now, they are crucial to enabling monitoring of the supply chain. So to be able to deal with deforestation, you need to know who's on the land, where. So you need to put people on the map and you need to, to know who they are. And, and only really governments can do that uh, yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Well, speaking of mapping, <laughs> Tom. Perfect. <laughs> perfect segue. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> We're coming over to you. You also have a love for forests, as we've heard very clearly, but a very different angle than Rachel's. I mean, the end goal is the same, but 
Exactly. I think you're exactly right. The end goal of nature flourishing in association with communities that are yep. being empowered by that nature is the, end, the same as the end goal. Uh, but my background is ecology. So I, I study specifically the organisms that exist within those, those ecosystems and how the interaction between those organisms and their environment makes for a stable and, and healthy ecosystem. And so in one hectare, how many organisms would you count as an ecologist? So that's funny that you, you mentioned the, the 300 number. Yeah. Many people will be looking at the birds and the mammals and maybe the reptiles and the amphibians yeah. to make that 300 number. But I'd probably say it's at least in the hundreds of billions when we're looking at the wait, microorganisms. Wait, 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 hold on. We'll say it again. I would say at least hundreds of billions. Hundreds we're of about, billions. We're talking about microorganisms in the soil. Mm. A, a gram of soil can have thousands of different species, let alone individuals. Uh, we're talking about nematodes are the most abundant animal on the planet, uh, all the way up to, you know, your insects that you can see and your, your spiders that you can interact with. There's an in, immensely diverse network of interactions that is responsible for keeping the whole system afloat. You uh, take that away, those trees don't last very long. Yeah, so in your world, I guess... Uh, an ant is a big, something big in that case. Exactly. And yeah. A bird or a mammal is a giant. And that, <laughs> well, I do think it's funny when you think about that scale. That the, yeah. you know, we think of the difference between maybe an ant and an elephant as being as different as you can get, but the difference between two microbial species can be a thousand times bigger than that. Really? You know, it's it's we're talking vast scales of of, of species differentiation, and that means vastly different ecosystem functions and mm. uh, the stability of a system is dependent on all of those players. So if Rachel's work is trying to help, help the, understand the, uh, the relationship between forests and, and humans in many ways, how would you describe your research? That's interesting. I, I would say the, our research is understanding the associations between organisms and their environment. Yeah. Um, and understanding how integral those organisms are for the maintenance of that environment. But that cannot be taken in isolation from the human component because humans are one of those organisms. Sure. We can be incredibly positive for the environment, yeah. and obviously, as we see globally today, we can also be incredibly negative for the, for the environment. And yeah. when, when humans can be integrated into a system that facilitates that network, we can, you know, we're an incredibly important part of because it becomes and it becomes Nirvana. <laughs> exactly. Right. right. There you go. So you also brought some footage for us. Right. And if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind if we could uh, take a look at that and tell us what we're taking a look at and what you'd yeah. like to share with us. So I guess, as I mentioned, the, the sort of core of ecology is that no species exists in isolation. Not any species can exist without the things it eats, the things it competes with, and it's that. And humans are the same. Uh, and yet we are, at a global scale, depleting those ecosystems. Mm. You know, we, we've got about three trillion trees left on the planet. Now that's about just an, almost half of what existed before human civilization. And we're still losing about 10 billion every year. It's a net number. Uh, and, and as Rachel mentioned, the scariest of all of that is even the ecosystems that remain, less than 5% of them are in their real pristine state with all those interactions that are necessary. But we do also see that outside of urban and agricultural lands, there's the potential that, well, there's about 0.9 billion hectares of degraded lands. And if we could protect those lands and allow nature to recover and facilitate that recovery in the long term, we estimated that there's a room for about another trillion trees in that land, which if they could be protected until maturity, could capture up to 30% of the excess carbon that's lingering in the atmosphere mm. to date as a, as a result of human activity. But this is an incredible potential. You know, we all are part of this incredible potential, but it's also not that simple. I think the danger of that is that it gives the idea that we can plant a load of trees and we'll be fine. Mm. And what tends to happen there is it's this tempting idea makes people plant a load of trees that are all the same species. Yeah. And that defeats the point of the ecosystem and the interactions and that network that we're talking about. Yeah. That's, that ecosystem is not resilient. It doesn't have the animals, the plants. It can't provide the services that are necessary, like clean water, air, nutrients that are necessary for human survival. Yeah. Um, 
It's, it can also be devastating for other ecosystems like grasslands and peatlands if you plant a load of trees on them. So ultimately, restoration or you know, the global restoration isn't about planting trees. It's about making a world where trees can recover, where ecosystems can recover for the health and well-being of the people that depend on them. Yep. And that's the key to all of this. Yep. Restoration is only sustainable if it, when we find the innovations that make it the economically viable option for local people, yeah. whether it's the protection of an existing forest so that soil fertility is good for the crops or the integration of different species into an agroforestry system that can increase crop yields or even the protection of a wetland so that uh, people can get carbon credits to continue protecting that land. Nature restoration is for the biodiversity and the people that depend on it at a local scale. And it's only as that network of, of action grows that it benefits so, us. So let me ask you a question on that one. That is, very simply, I mean, it might seem very obvious to you, but why is biodiversity so essential? Why is it so important? Again, we can't live without it. That's the, the, the basic idea, the basic answer to anyone who doesn't particularly care, uh, you know, doesn't have a particular interest in, in nature. But as Rachel mentioned, it is at the core of, every, of, of everything, of our spirituality, of our existence, of our happiness, of our well-being. But, okay, but biodiversity, so that means that I need to love the mosquitoes that annoy me and the midges and... Now, or... biodiversity is the full network of interacting species, including the, including, you know, the environment in which they live. And in that environment, the competition among species is just as important as the facilitation. Some species mm -hmm. help one another, some species fight with one another. And by me fighting against you, Rachel can survive better. <laughs> you know, the com competition is equally necessary. So even the species that don't, we don't directly love yeah. are still necessary for our own survival. Yeah. But when we think about climate change, this is on climate day, why does biodiversity matter with climate? So biodiversity is essential for trapping away carbon. As I mentioned, mm -hmm. we can, if we could protect the ecosystems we have and restore where it's, where it's possible, we could capture up to 30% of the excess carbon in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So that is immediately, simply put, for carbon, a very important point. But I want to stress that if climate change never existed, the protection and revitalization of Earth's biodiversity is still an absolutely top priority because it underpins all life on Earth and can help us with every global threat, including pandemics, yeah. food shortages, and everything else. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting point, especially when you note that there's only 5%, less than 5% of the extant forests that both of you said that it could, could, could be considered pristine. Right. It's and so rare. You look on Google Maps and try and find an undisturbed ecosystem. Rachel? Yeah, I would like to get away from this word pristine, though. Okay. I, I mean, we were trying to say not super degraded, more intact, but it's really important to understand that people have been living in these places for thousands and thousands of years. So just that pristine doesn't mean the absence of people, but rather the healthy functioning ecosystem. Okay. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I know in, in, the yeah. marine, in the marine world, we're trying to create marine protected areas of ecosystems in the ocean, which are, you know. Yeah, I mean, we say we want protected areas, but we need to make place for people in those protected areas because actually people can help protect them. Yeah. And so, so when you exclude people, you can actually get worse outcomes. Yeah, great point. It's a good reminder. It's serious. That's a really great reminder. Now, Tom, we also had some students visit you in the lab. Well, your foot was broken, so you, you couldn't be in the lab, but we had a colleague of yours. You were generous enough to have a colleague meet the students, um, and one of your scientists could explain a few things to them, and then they came to you in your home afterwards. Yep. I'm not mistaken. Yep. So we're going to take a look at the film and hear what they had to say and when, what they learned. What you see here is the high resolution imagery that shows you satellite images with a resolution of 50 centimeter. And the cool thing is that you can really see from 2012 on how this site is changing. 
And in this case, you can really detect a significant change in the landscape. Do you have any possibility yet to count the single number of trees that you've planted? So far, it's very difficult for people on the field. They have to go out to the field and count the trees. The goal is, of course, to use artificial intelligence to then be able to just take a satellite imagery where you see these individual trees and let an algorithm count these trees. But in the future, we hope this is possible. That's good. Hey guys. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet what you happened me. with your foot? Uh, yes, I damaged it playing paddle tennis. How did you get the idea with the team of the Crowdfood Lab to create this platform of, of Restore? We decided to build a platform quite like Google Maps, essentially. But instead of seeing hairdressers and shops, you can see the species of trees that live there or the, or the types of herbaceous plants that, that are nat natural there or the amount of carbon that's stored in the soil. How can the platform help uh, a single person actually do something to change? Every little thing you do is great. You can look at a tree and just tell scientists where it is. That's incredibly valuable for climate models. Okay. Or buy coffee from the right coffee shop. It's literally everything. Everything we wear, everything we eat, everything we do has an impact on the environment. I think growing transparency in our decisions is what's going to make the, the difference. If you had a message for the people in our generation in a few sentences, what would you say is the most important thing that we should take on w from this project? We're the first people facing the threat of climate change, but we're also the first people who can save the world against it. And we can do that with every single one of our decisions. It can be so empowering when you stop using so much plastic and you go, whoa, I did it, That's, I'm so proud of myself. And you start growing some local food and you go, whoa, I can do this, it's incredible. And the more, the sort of more positive actions you take, the more positive is for your own psychology anyway. And it gets you doing more and more and more uh, positive actions that can have such a crazy impact. Because really, when you dive in, it's we're facing the biggest threat humans have ever faced. That's so cool. Like, based on different information. I didn't also see. So, Tom, we're facing the biggest threat that humans have ever faced, and it's so cool. A stunning statement. I'm not sure I share your, your emotions on that one, but help me understand that one. Well, I feel like, I, I think we are all aware of how devastating this threat is, particularly for local people around, around the world who depend on nature so more intrinsically than we do. And it is such a depressing concept. It's such a depressing thought. Now, that depression, unfortunately, you know, in some cases it can inspire people to, to, to form, to, to sort of, make coalitions that, that, that pressure change, and that is really, really important. But in other situations, that depression can discourage us from doing anything. We go, oh, it's all, it's over. It's too big, it's just, it's just it's too, too big. big. Yeah. Just give up, exactly. And I think what, what is so exciting is this idea that in every single action I take, I can help to fight one of the worst things that's ever threatened our planet, that's ever threatened humanity. Every kid, every schoolboy wants to fight against this, you know, the bad villain that's against the superheroes. We are fighting the worst villain there's ever been. We have the most incredible story to, to, to take on as a society, and every single one of us can be a part of that. And every schoolgirl too. And, <laughs> and what's really interesting for me from both of you is your clear statements about personal decisions and personal actions. This comes from both of you. Mm -hmm. I think that's really a message that I'm taking away from today is, hey, it is up to me and it's up to you, it's up to us, it's up to we to really make those decisions. Now, you also have helped create a tool. I think it's come out of your lab. It's called Restore. Um, and we have some footage on that. And that can be one of those things that can help us understand actions we can be taking or not. I mean, this is not quite exactly sure. So what are, what are we looking at? Yeah, so Restore is designed for exactly that reason. Because at the moment when we buy a coffee or we uh, donate to a project that's doing conservation or we, whatever we do, it's sort of lost into the ether. Restore is built so that we can all see the start to begin to see the impact of every one of our actions. So what are we actually seeing here then? What's it actually 
Let's do it. So you, you go into a, the website. This is a fancy animation showing you nothing. This yeah. is how <laughs> Restore works. You, dr you can draw around any area on the map. You learn about its ecological state. You know, learn about the species that live there. But you can also see it changing over time. And actually, the imagery is much better than this picture shows. You'll be able to see the trees and the vegetation changing over the last decade. And that means that we are now tangibly connected to that, to that footprint. So what you could do, what, what the, the future we see really is coffee shops, you know, and, and clothes shops and everything else you do. You go in and you say, I'd like to get a coffee, but how do you know it's, it's sustainably produced? And they go, well, here's the farm that I got it from. These are the people. This is the, oh, the, really? the yeah. thing. And you can go, ah, whoa, I definitely, yeah, I'm going to buy that coffee, not that coffee. Now every single one of us is tangibly connected to the decisions we make and their impact on the land. That's really cool. And so those were people, they were, do, they were measuring on the ground? I mean, maybe this is, yeah. Right now, it's, Restore is built of about, I think it's in the, in the order of 40,000 locations where someone has done that. They've drawn their shape and they've said, I'm conserving this land or I'm protecting this land or I'm restoring this land. And you can go on and, and look around and see all of those projects and see what they're doing and learn about them and monitor them. But the, those guys are the heroes, the core, the base of Restore. But ultimately, what we need to do is build on, build into that to bring in the, the rest of the system, all the people buying the food from it, all the people uh, it, buying and selling the carbon credits or validating the projects. And, and once, we, once we build up that marketplace of all the people that are connected to nature, then we can all start to be much more transparent in how we engage in nature. And so, if, so when I go into, say, if I want to go and look at, you said the Zurichberg up at the, the Dolder, and I look around the Dolder, or something, and I can actually go in and look at what's there. Exactly. And no. it will tell me, and do you have people go measure the trees to make sure that they're that big, or what, is it just? No, all the data comes from, from millions of observations around the world where people have, have, huh. have, have done some studies and identified the, the carbon storage and the, yeah. the microorganisms in the soil and the trees that are there. We then, scientists all around the world have then built models, global maps that tell us Ah, this ecosystem looks like this. This ecosystem looks like this. Yeah. And that means that in Restore, when you draw your shape around your garden, you now get all these layers of information. You say, oh, these are all the species that are there. Oh, these are the microbes that live there. This is the amount of carbon in the soil. This is how much carbon could be in the soil. And with all those yeah. layers of information, that can help the land managers to overcome some of the, the little hurdles that, well, not little hurdles, some of the huge hurdles that they yeah. face in, in getting restoration. So could, could this be something which your farmers could be using or is this it's not in my mind it's not quite <laughs> the way um that tom described it it's i mean that could work on a very small scale in my opinion that you could go into a coffee shop and maybe if there's a direct sourcing line between that particular land parcel and that coffee shop but unfortunately the world food system is a lot more complex and um and a majority of the food sourcing is not traced to an individual farm so what we really need is a big structural shift in our food system to get to Tom's dream, you know, for, for you to be able to then link a parcel to an actual person, we need to know where food comes from. And right now we don't. So there's, there's some stuff in the middle <laughs> that we have to change first, but then yes, then yes, we can get to that dream. So when, we get to, when we change the world systems, <laughs> when we can, and then we have all the tools, but we do have today, Clara, who is the CEO of Restore, who's going to come into our studio right now. And she's the CEO of the new platform. Welcome, Clara. Great to see you. Thanks so much. Well, thanks for coming into the, the pavilion. We appreciate that. And um, I have a question. You, you just relocated to Switzerland recently as well, just as our other guests in the pavilion. Where did you come from? I came from Mexico City about a month ago. So you couldn't resist the forest of Switzerland either. <laughs> what? What brought you here? I came for Restore. I, I came for Restore. I love Mexico. I'm really excited to make Switzerland my new home, but Restore was the motivation to come and be a part of creating something new that can help bring solutions to this big challenge we have about restoring our ecosystems. And so tell me, in your view, you just started, tell me your view of the potential of the tool. And tell, describe how you just... Tell me how you describe the tool as a CEO. How yeah, you, you get each it? of our versions. Yeah, I want, I want your version <laughs> now. Yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, most fundamentally, Restore is a place that is built to allow anyone, 
anywhere in the world to engage in restoration. And, you know, you've heard examples of what restoration can be. It's, it's a broad range, anything from, you know, restoring native shrubs in your backyard to changing the way that agricultural systems are, are managed and you have trees and cattle farms and you might be changing the way that cover crops are. You might be restoring wetlands. You might be regrowing forests, whether that's replanting or natural regeneration. And there's a lot of people involved in that. And we want to enable those people with basic ecological information, and really importantly, with a connection to each other. So what we see is that there's, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of people around the world who are doing work in restoration, and often they're doing it in isolation. And so Restore is a place that brings them data, but it also brings them each other. Yeah. So, and, and, and so you were, what were you doing before you came to, the re, to do Restore? What were you doing in Mexico City? So before Restore, I worked for a nonprofit organization that helped companies, sort of like Rachel described, implement responsible sourcing policies. So they had made commitments to no deforestation associated with all the palm oil that they bought, or all of the cocoa, or all of the soy. And we helped them on the ground to do that, to do that work with small farmers, larger farmers, plantations. And what I started to see was companies that were trying to figure out how their supply chains not only could keep forests standing, but actually regrow forests, regrow ecosystems, and do that in farms. Um, and so really, they were thinking about restoration through supply chains. And I saw, saw Restore as a way to experiment with and support restoration in a completely different way. So it's sort of like confirming what Rachel was just mentioning about if there's this lack of transparency in between that point and that point, it doesn't do us much good. That Absolutely. You absolutely, absolutely agree. So who are some of the partners on Restore? So many. <laughs> we're really excited on, on June 5th, we're yep. going to be launching a beta version of the platform. And at that point, we will be announcing the founding network of Restore. So that's all of the hundreds of organizations who have already signed up for the platform, who have shared their thousands and thousands of sites around the world. And we're going to be inviting more members to join that network. So anyone, you, you know, and and all of the the great people who are doing this work on the ground. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think all right, you mentioned before, Tom, Google Maps. Are you using Google Maps as a backbone or are you making your own new tool? So it's a combination. Okay. Google was a partner in developing the platform with us. Yeah. And they, they co-developed a lot of the basis for Restore. And they've handed that over to us now. We're our own organization, of course, with lots of support from ETH, from the Crowther Lab, and support from Google. Um, but Google Maps is the, the background, the base layer. And then we bring in additional imagery for the satellite you know, monitoring going back in time. We bring in lots of other data. So it's a piece of it. So I'm going to ask a question that I ask the other colleagues here in, in the pavilion. So what does the fate of forests mean to you? <laughs> the fate of forests is the fate of us. And I think that Rachel and Tom made that really clear. Mm -hmm. The fate of forests is, is also, you know, the fate of many other ecosystems. And Restore wants to highlight that. So I'm not sure how much more nuance I can bring. I think that, uh, that Tom and Rachel have said it so well. well. That's good. I'm glad to have. So um, what would you like for our audience, myself as well, every citizen of Switzerland to understand about or do with Restore? What would you, what would you right. wish us to do? Yeah, it's a great question. A few things. I think first, come log in and explore. You know, see who else is out there, see the movement of thousands and thousands of people around the world who are actively restoring Earth's ecosystems and changing the way that land is managed. Get a sense of what that looks like and then think about doing it yourself. And that might be directly because you have a piece of land that you can restore and it might be doing it indirectly by donating to a project by changing the decisions that you're making about the food that you eat but start thinking you know what is my land footprint every time that i am involved in a decision it has an impact on the land somehow so that's the invitation join restore join the restoration movement be a part of it that's great well thank you for that. i think that's a really that's really good. I can't wait for the, the 5th of June, right? Is that correct? 5th of June. Okay, that's I can't right. wait for that day. We have another student question, and we're going to roll that right now. Hi, 
My name's Leon. How do you want to get your knowledge and information across to the average citizen? So I, I think we heard some implications of that from you, Claire, just a second ago. And I'm going to give you a chance to come back to you. You can maybe add to it. But Tom, how would you answer that question? How do you suggest we need to bring knowledge to the average citizen? I think knowledge is always best shared through inspiration. So when you sort of capture people's imagination, um, it could be that you, you know, show sh like Rachel's story. You know, the first, you know, she started getting into nature, nature conservation because she was in a stunning tropical forest. Mm -hmm. You know, that story is so key. And I guess that's kind of why we built Restore. We want everyone's story or, or their connection to land to become much, much easier. Right now, we're so disconnected from our gardens, let alone from our, you know, from, from places the other side of the world. And now what we'd like to do is build out those stories so you can see, you, you know, start to understand what nature truly is. That's great. Rich, what about you? How do we bring our knowledge, your knowledge, to the average citizen? Well, I mean, I think these platforms are super important for, for fostering that, that network and engagement. But I also don't want people to be complacent. So <laughs> I want people to still have this, this burning need to change the system. They need to vote. They need to change the structures around them. They need to pressure the companies. So if they can be inspired and informed by these, these platforms like Restore, that's fantastic. But they shouldn't stop there. They need to go further. That's great. Now, thank you for that. And Claire, what about you? Anything to add? How would you like to suggest to bring the knowledge to the average citizen and climate change, the fate of forests in general? So maybe I'll bridge what both Tom and Rachel said and just say that it's not either or, it's and, you know? It's let's show you where you are, how your impact is, and let that be a starting point so that you're engaging with the companies that you buy from, you're engaging with your government, you know, Take that across the board. That's a, that's a, a perfect answer for a CEO of a new <laughs> startup. I think that's fantastic. And I mean that sincerely. So thank you so much, Claire, for joining us here at the Rethink. Thanks for having me. Living Pavilion and um, for your insights and your passion and your commitment. We need it. And I wish you all your best. And I look forward. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. So we would like to bring our hour together slowly to a close. Unfortunately, we don't really want to bring it to a close, but I have to by making sure we've answered some of those questions from our students from the very beginning. Really short answers. Here we go. Can we actually stop climate change and should we? Yes. <laughs> very very simple. Short, yes. yes. I mean, short yes. answer. Perfect. All right. Yes. <laughs> we can stop it and we but should. But we need to do something completely different than what we're doing right now. Yep. You know? So, because we're not getting any closer with our current behavior and our current governments. So, we need to, to change our behavior, and we need to vote, and we need to change the system. Okay, Tom? I, don't, I think there are some, system, some processes that have been set in place that won't be entirely returned, but that doesn't mean that we can't fight for a better future. There is a million things that we can all do to slow the rate of climate change, minimize the damage, uh, and, re and protect and revitalize biodiversity that can make a future world a better one than we have today. Okay, second question was, can, what can we as individuals do when the most of the damage is done by the biggest corporations? You've mentioned choice, voting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's both, right? I mean, because, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm just, I'm just looking at both of you. <laughs> what else? So, yes, so, and so, what else? So, the great thing is, uh, the worst thing is, companies cause the majority of the damage. The great thing is, it's only a handful of companies in, in most places. So, you can actually pinpoint them and get them to change. And that's what we're, we're all working together for right now. Um, so you need to be aware of that and not support those companies unless they're actually making those policies and implementing them. Hey, Tom? My answer was the same. We, yes, it's the companies that make the biggest impact, but we can have an impact by pressuring those companies and do. those governments. And that's not just by, you know, it, it's, it's by, again, by everything we do, by everything we, every way we interact with uh, economic systems and the environment. We can every little decision we make can put pressure on organizations to improve. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's really important. So personal responsibility and accountability. It's the very Swiss characteristics, <laughs> which we're very, we believe in and are very strong. And we need to really take that seriously when it does the climate change. 
The last question here at the, at the very beginning was, what will happen when we are reaching the tipping point of deforestation? What will the effect be? You mentioned the savanna, that the, that the Amazon can flip to the savanna. But what, what about the rest of the world? I mean, when we reach that tipping point, then what? I mean, there's a number of tipping points that are happening and continue to happen in ocean systems that are that are, that are changed irreparably and and climate systems that are changing you know we see the warmer it gets the more arctic the more carbon is released from arctic soils which accelerates climate change and that is a feedback process that will continue even if we stopped emissions right now the point is it, i don't think we should be going oh okay one day it's going to be too much Every little action that we are doing in the to deplete ecosystems and to release carbon is having knock-on consequences for everything else. I talked about that immense network of interactions. Yeah. If you lose one mosquito, it'll have a knock-on consequence for the other species in the, in the ecosystem. And the same is true. That, that ecological principle applies to the globe. Yeah, the takeaway point from tipping points should just be that delaying action any longer is a lose-lose. You know, it's just going to make it more costly for us to solve this problem because we're going to have further to come back from. Yeah. And it's going to be even harder because of all these feedbacks. That's a very succinct and clear message right there. We have one final student question, and that's going to be... Hi, my name is Hira, and since the Climate Day is coming up, what is the best way to advocate for climate change, and what do you think of the protests? So, so how do we advocate? What... You mentioned consumption, choices, voting. How do we advocate? What would you, uh, anything else? And what do you think of the protests? Who wants to? I mean, I personally think the protests are, are a critical part of the whole story. And I think, but I think everybody's going to find their own way in this process. So, yeah. you know, the youth have been incredible out front. Um, but there's things that we can all do in different ways. And, you know, the thing that I do is actually work with the companies to try to help them improve and, and with policymakers. But we shouldn't degrade anybody's decision about how they want to fight this battle. We should be supporting them in all the different ways that they fight it. Yeah. I'm also all for the, the marches, the people, you know, society getting engaged in this. And I think that's the one thing I'd say is, is take it on, make it part of your life and every decision you make and everything you do, it's in inspiring and exciting to be involved in, in climate change. So whatever it is, that action that you're taking, turn off your light a little bit more, save some water, in, you know, donate to an organization that you think is amazing, invest in companies that you think are great. Every little action can be that way of having a positive impact and, and it can make your life better while you do it. So here's a, a let's bring it back to Switzerland for a moment. Sure as we've been taking beautiful, sometimes terrifying journey around the world, what one or two, three things would you suggest that I should do tomorrow when, to, when we're right here and we're thinking about that personal action and what, 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 what little things would you say to me, Chris, these are the three things that you should be really, you should be doing. Right. What are those? What are those three things? And you don't know my life, but you don't know any of our. We don't know any of our life. Yeah. But what would you? What would you say? Are the three most important things here in Switzerland. And I'm not a citizen. I can't get to vote. At the yeah, ballot. it's it's not always as easy as tomorrow being the perfect opportunity. So it's an ongoing journey. But I think you have to engage in the hard conversations. You know, it's easy to just get by um, and not talk about politics and not talk about responsibility, and not talk about what you eat and what you buy. But, but the, all of that is important. Those conversations need to be had, and we need to spread our knowledge about how the system works and what we know about how we can change it. So you need to go forward and be honest and, and communicate with people. Great. Thank you. Tom? It's hard to have three things. It's everything. But I guess, first, take an interest. Just... Just next time you buy milk, just find out, you know, just if you can, if it's not impossibly hard, which, as Rachel mentioned, there's immensely <laughs> complicated systems that, that make it difficult. But if you can, show a little interest and go, oh, do you know what? That's where my milk, milk probably comes from. Oh, OK. Next one, try to take action. Maybe go, oh, do you know what? I'm not sure where that milk from, comes from, but I am pretty sure where that milk comes from. All right, maybe I'm going to go for this one because I think I can start shape, sh shaping the market with those decisions. 
And the third, tell other people about it. I would say, don't make it an isolated, oh, now I'm doing my, my green bit. I live it. And I think when you internalize the fight, it's empowering for us as individuals and obviously has a, a, a knock-on benefit for the world. It's great advice. So I'm hearing you tell me that we all should be doing is engage in the issue, don't avoid it. It's not going to go away. It's only going to get harder and harder. Responsible consumption. Think about what we're buying and how we're buying it and where we're buying it, where it comes from, to learn about the issues, to inform ourselves. It is not up to somebody else. As you said, we can't you know, slough that off on a little green tag. We have to learn about these things and ask where things come from and why and then communicate that you, I, that we are doing that. Don't hide the fact that we're actually making those decisions. As you said, Tom, to live it. I think that's really fantastic advice. You know, but I really... So I would like to say to you both, and to Clara, who has had to leave the pavilion, to thank you so much um, for your research, for your dedication for these for your topics, um, for also being here with us today. And finally, I would like to thank you for making the time to join us today in the Rethinking Living Pavilion here on top of the Riggy. The entire production team is grateful that you have joined us to learn a little bit more about the fate of forests. And I hope you have been inspired as I have been to learn more, to engage more, as well as to tune in for the next time we get together. So go to the website, the ETH Rethinking Living website, check out what's there, and I look forward to seeing you again. Auf Wiedersehen mit den Hand. <laughs>